Hey there, everybody. Today we are here to talk about the good word of electronic fuel injection. So I'm gonna go ahead and screen share here and we'll go ahead and get this party started. The last lecture video we had, we talked a lot about uh, fuel delivery components. Um, so it's really mainly about the components and what they do. Um, in this section, we're gonna talk about how each of the fuel injection styles work. Um, so, uh, we're gonna talk about the principles, uh, we're gonna talk about the point of injection in different places and how that's affected and what affects them. Uh, we're gonna talk about the design and function, um, about some of the extra components maybe we didn't talk about last time. Uh, we'll talk about how the computer can, uh, supplies a correct air fuel ratio, um, the sensors involved, and then we'll talk about fuel pressure regulation. So first things first, I think it's really hard to understand all of the really idiosyncrasies of these systems without talking about gasoline. And this is usually the part in class where we would spend uh, probably a solid 30 minutes just of people asking random questions about gasoline. So feel free to leave anything in uh, the comments or the discussion board in class and I uh, will help you out the best of my ability. But I'll just talk about a few points that I usually talk about or I usually get lots of questions on. The first thing is, is uh, additives. There's lots of gas stations around, Shell, Chevron, um, all kinds of stuff that claim that their particular additives do something better or, or more efficiently, they're gonna help you get better gas mileage. Some of them are true, some of them are not true. So it's sort of important, I'm not gonna get into each of the additives, but I will tell you that most of your gas stations are going to, I don't wanna say all of them, but a good chunk of your gas stations are gonna get gas from the same places. Um, some, are going to get it from better places than others. So I wanna talk first and foremost about uh, something I should have put on here, but I didn't. A term that you might've seen called top tier, um, T-E-I-R. If your gas station says top tier on it, what that really means is that that gas is held to a particular level of scrutinization, essentially. And it's going to contain at least a certain amount of certain things to say that it's a decent quality. So right here, I've got additives on the slide. Uh, top tier gasoline is for sure going to contain more detergents than your average non-top tier gasoline. What does that even mean? Well, what do you use to clean your laundry? use detergents, right? We use to clean things, you use detergents, that means they clean things or keep things clean. And in the case of your gasoline, it's talking about the tops of your intake valves um, and such, carbon deposits and things like that. So if you're not using top tier gasoline, especially in port fuel injection, um, because on direct, we don't even have gasoline touching the intake valve at all, but we'll get into that later. Detergents are gonna help keep everything that the gasoline touches clean, and it's going to allow for all the components inside the system to remain cleaner than if they didn't have it. And so it is shown that if you use top tier gas in a, ga a vehicle rather than non top tier gas, you will get more longevity out of all of the fuel components, specifically your fuel injectors. Uh, if you're not using top tier gas, they may get clogged a little bit more easily. Um, another thing is going to be octane boosters. Uh, you guys have heard of that term octane, right? When you see the number on the button at the gas station, 87, 89, 91, that is actually referring to your octane rating. So the octane, uh, before I even get into octane boosters, it's important to know what the heck octane is. So octane is actually referring not to how great the gas is. And I really hate gas stations for doing this to you guys and to everybody out there. They will say 87 is regular and then 89 is plus and then 91 will be extra plus or super plus or premium. You got to love that word. It's premium gas. That number has nothing to do with the quality of gasoline behind that pump at all. The quality of gasoline is going to determine which brand you go with. Uh, the number, the octane rating, is really going to determine one thing, and that is how hard it is to ignite. 
weird, right? So there is a common misbelief that if you use a higher octane rating that you will make more horsepower, get better gas mileage, or your engine will be happier. That's not the case unless your uh, vehicle manufacturer recommends it for that engine or you built an engine that has a higher compression ratio or maybe you're using higher boost. Those would be the only times you need 91. Uh, or a higher even than that octane. The high octane keeps the gasoline from igniting too early. If we have gasoline that ignites too early, we have problems. Um, something called pre-ignition is one of those major problems. And we're gonna talk about that later on in this presentation because uh, it's when things go wrong. Well, if you have an engine that has high compression, high boost, high pressures inside the, the cylinders, then that gasoline is going to potentially ignite too early. And so we recommend a higher octane rating like 91. Now, the lower the octane rating, the easier it is to ignite. So if you are driving a Honda Civic stock, um, not SI, not Type R, if you're driving a Toyota Corolla, if, uh, if you're driving a regular economical vehicle, um, or it could be a truck, it doesn't matter. If it doesn't have very high compression or it's not running boost or anything like that, you don't need to worry about having a high octane rating. In fact, you will actually produce excess emissions uh, if you are using a higher than rated octane. So go ahead and take a look in your owner's manual and see what it is that they recommend for your vehicle. Some vehicles will recommend 87, some will recommend uh, 91, somewhere in between. Sometimes there's 89, but you rarely see any big manufacturers recommend 89. It, it, it is there, just few and far between. And then there are, um, if you're building a race engine with extremely high compression, you may need race gas. That's what race gas really is all about. It's high octane. Um, and it's also leaded, so be careful. Don't use race gas in your Toyota Corolla if it's stock because you will eat up your catalytic converter. Um, just throwing that out there. Don't use race gas unless you need it. Don't use 91 unless you need it. Now, if you your vehicle calls for 91, and let's say it's a computer-controlled vehicle, if it calls for 91, and you put 87 in it because you're just being cheap and you don't like your car very much, then you can run into a couple problems. If it's old, uh, if it's old technology, you could damage the engine. Um, the reason for this is it will cause pre-ignition. Anything remotely modern, it may not damage the engine, but it will detune your engine. You will definitely make less power uh, because the engine's trying to keep any damage from happening from pre-ignition. So just throwing that out there. Now back to our additives. Octane boosters can increase the octane rating of your gasoline. You can buy octane, uh, octane boosters at different uh, uh, automotive um, distributors as far as like AutoZone or O'Reilly. Sorry, I couldn't kind of come up with words there. Uh, but there are also boosters in gasoline to make it a 91 or an 89 versus an 87. Now, the next thing is going to be oxygenates. The most common one you'll probably see is ethanol. Regular gasoline on the street that you guys buy is usually really what it's called is E10, meaning that it contains a, around 10% ethanol. So there's, is ethanol good or ethanol bad arguments, right? All over the place. Ethanol can be good. It does have properties that allow it a higher octane rating in some instances. So it's actually quite common in the racing world for people to use uh, ethanol, right? But they're not using necessarily E10 in that situation. They're using E85. That number after the E is referring to the percentage of ethanol that the gasoline has in it. Uh, so if it is E10, it's going to contain 10% ethanol. If it's E15, it's going to contain 15% ethanol, so on and so forth. If you're day-to-day -day driving, ethanol is not good. And no matter how many corn commercials you see, ethanol is not good for your vehicle's fuel system. Number one reason, ethanol is uh, essentially an alcohol 
and it does not contain anything that's going to lubricate the fuel system components. So gasoline does more than just provide something to burn in the cylinder. It provides lubrication and cooling to all of the components all the way up to uh, the cylinder there. And so you, if you're using gasoline that has excess ethanol in it, you could be looking at uh, fuel injectors that don't last as long, fuel pumps that don't last as long, things like that, because they're not getting lubricated because of that ethanol. So you don't necessarily want high ethanol percentages in your gasoline unless it's for a specific purpose. So be careful of that. I will tell you that some gasoline stations, they, they push their limit. So if it says it, that it's supposed to be E10 or it's just regular gasoline, around 10% um, is around the legal limit uh, that you want those at. Now, doesn't mean that you're never going to find gasoline that has higher percentages in it. And there's actually a few good YouTube videos. I'll try to find one to post in the Canvas class here that you can actually test your own gasoline to see what, uh, what the content is. Again, you really do want a lower ethanol rating for your daily driver to just make sure everything stays in good working order for a long time. So uh, that is gasoline in a nutshell. So we're gonna go ahead and talk about more stuff. The main thing that we're gonna talk about today is fuel injection because the name of this presentation is electronic fuel injection, which is why in bold on the left, it says EFI, electronic fuel injection, because everything we're gonna talk about in this section falls under that umbrella term, electronic fuel injection. If fuel is injected and it is controlled by electronics, it is going to fall under the EFI category no matter whether it's any of these, TBI, MPI, CA, uh, well, technically not CIS, but like GDI. I threw CIS in there because um, it's something you may see with German manufacturers. So I'll explain that later, but it doesn't necessarily fall under the category of EFI. So just uh, keep that in mind. I'll have to change that in this presentation here. Uh, but TBI, or throttle body injection, I want you to know that for a lot of these, there's actually multiple terms involved. So if you hear TBI, that means throttle body injection. Um, if you hear CFI, that stands for central fuel injection, which is another term for TBI or throttle body injection. So they are really one and the same. There is, uh, I'll get to CMFI in a moment here. The next stage up was MPI. So if you've heard of port injection, that is referring to MPR, multi-port injection, so it's the same thing. Now there's a couple terms that fall under that, like tuned port injection or sequential fuel injection. Tuned port injection is a, a term that uh, GM actually tokened for their fuel injection. It was a multi-port fuel injection system. Um, there was a difference in their intake runners. So uh, that is just simply, it's another term from another OEM. That's really all it is. And same with uh, SFI or sequential fuel injection. Sequential fuel injection is actually referring to like a type of timing or how we uh, sequence essentially our fuel injectors. Um, now going down further, before we went, well, not before, somewhere in the middle between TBI and MPI, there was something called CMFI, we'll talk more about that, that central multi-port injection, where it's sort of a melding of the two, of TBI and MPI. And then there is CIS, which is a continuous, in continuous injection system. I've got continuous fuel injection here, same thing. Um, we'll talk about that, I've got a quick slide. And then lastly, where we find ourselves now is where we're at with GDI or gasoline direct injection. I've got slides for most of these, so. We'll go ahead and talk about that. First things first, throttle body injection. What is it? I know last uh, class session or last lecture, we talked a little bit about this, at least about the throttle body injectors themselves. Really what's most important is that uh, you'll notice in this presentation, there is no carburetors because we, don't, we haven't used carburetors since the late 80s. Right after carburetors, this is where throttle body injection came in. Some people call it an electronic carburetor. That is not the case at all. 
No, the only thing that it shares with carburetors is where it injects at. Everything else about it design-wise is nowhere near the same as a carburetor. They actually have electronic carburetors, but I'm not going to get into that because that wasn't really something that uh, OEMs sought after. So um, throttle body injection is on top of our intake manifold, similar to like where our uh, carburetor would squirt fuel in, right? Instead, it uses electronic fuel injectors, which they're essentially what we call solenoids. I believe I mentioned this last lecture as well. Uh, it's, if you remember the relay videos, it's very similar to a relay. Any solenoid is going to take a small amount of current and it's going to use that magnetic field um, from running current through a coil of wire. And it's gonna use that magnetic field for something. Relays use it to close a switch. Solenoids use it to open or close a component. There's going to be some sort of movement involved. And that's what our fuel injectors are. They're essentially like a relay, but instead of moving a switch with the magnetic field, it's moving uh, a fuel injector to open. So throttle body injection will generally have, and you can see down here, we've got two big fat fuel injectors here. Those are actually what we call side feeds. So you can see sort of a cutaway here up on the top. We've got our fuel inlet and fuel hangs out here until our fuel injector opens up, right? And here's our electrical connector. Carburetors don't need any computer controlling or any electronics to run them. Throttle body injectors do. Now, it's very easy to convert from carburetion to throttle body injection. They bolt right up, and most, like Holly, um, uh, that there's many companies that will make aftermarket conversion kits that you have your own little tuner, and it comes with all the electronics that you need to control it, which is really cool, um, and, and uh, a little bit easier than carburetors for some people if you're not familiar with how to tune them and all that fun stuff. So it, it takes the guessing out of that. So we'll generally have one or two fuel injectors up at the top. Uh, carburetors ran around five to 10 PSI max. I mean, 10 PSI would actually be really high. Um, but generally we're looking at really low fuel pressure. With throttle body injection, we need a little bit higher fuel pressure. High fuel pressure is going to be, it's going to create what we call a pressure differential, meaning I've got pressure up here and no pressure down here. The higher the pressure differential, the better the fuel atomization. And since carburetors did this using booster venturies and emulsion tubes and stuff to try to atomize because they don't have a very big pressure differential, what they would do is they would, uh, for fuel, for, for carburetors, they would add these extra things to try to create more of a pressure differential. Throttle body injection would just simply have a higher fuel pressure, around 15 to 20 PSI. And most of the time, well, most of the time in our assembly, our throttle body, our TBI injection assembly, we would have some sort of fuel pressure regulator here to regulate our fuel pressure as well. Um, as I mentioned, fuels injected, injected at a central location above the throttle plate. So down here, we've got these two little red throttle plates here. Um, but you can see in this picture here, we've got a throttle valve and our fuel injector is injecting above that throttle plate. That's super important to note. And the reason for this is that pressure differential I was just talking about here. And so, I want you to note a couple of things. First thing, TBI injects above the throttle plate. The next thing is that fuel pressure does not vary and it doesn't need to vary. Just like carburetor, because of where it injects, it doesn't need to vary. Fuel pressure can stay the same the entire time. Well, and you might be like, well, then what controls more fuel or less fuel? Like if I'm stepping on the gas pedal, I'm assuming I'm getting more fuel. If fuel pressure never changes, what we do instead on this design is we will simply control the amount of fuel used by how long we open up that injector for. And that's a term called pulse width. So pulse width is how long the injector uh, is generally turned on. We'll talk more about that later. But this is throttle body injection right here. Oops. So here we have a picture of our, uh, this is actually a bad picture on the left. This is a top feed fuel injector. We don't use top feed for TBI, but they're just showing a one-off fuel injector here. That is an electronic solenoid. Over here on the right, you can see here is our engine. Here's our intake runners. Um, 
I lost my mouse again. Here's our throttle plate, and we're above that throttle plate, we have our throttle body injector injecting fuel when the computer tells it to. Now, that would be the stepping stone to uh, what ended up being a central multi-port injection. This is an in-between of TBI and port fuel injection. Um, Chevy used this for quite a while on their 90s Chevy trucks. It was a big pile of crap because it had a lot of problems. They had to extend the warranty to over 100,000 miles on a lot of vehicles, um, and it cost Chevy a lot of, a lot of money. Uh, a lot of technicians made money off of this, so I guess there's that. So how this worked, it, it was like a throttle body injection in that it had one main fuel injector up at the top. But instead of injecting fuel above the throttle plate, what we had are these hard steel lines that go to what would be a fuel injector is down very much like a port fuel injection right above our intake valve there. But instead of those little injectors being electronic, they were simply mechanical poppet nozzles. And so we had one big electronic fuel injector that would feed fuel to all these poppet nozzles. Well, they had a really big problem with leaking and you would get puddles of fuel in your intake manifold. This is all not good. Uh, anytime we have external fuel leaks, we run the risk of catching our vehicle on fire, customer's vehicle on fire. Um, like I said, this was a really big mess up for, for Chevy. They had a lot of problems with this one. Um, and then they stopped using it because they realized it was not a good design. Now, what we're looking at here is another stepping stone. This one was actually, I mean, this is dated back to the 70s on some German manufacturers like Porsche. CIS or continuous injection systems used uh, mechanical injectors. They weren't necessarily poppet nozzles in the same respect as the uh, central multiport injection. Um, but what we have here, and this is a real life picture. I think this one's a Mercedes down here. Here's our intake manifold. Here's our little mechanical injectors on the bottom of our intake manifold, right above our intake there. Now, what's really cool about this system, now it's just way too complicated for its own good, but, and you can have multiple problems with it, but it's a really cool design. So you can see here, here's our engine, here's our injector. Um, We've got a hard line that's gonna go to, because if I've got multiple injectors at each cylinder, how, how do I time them properly? Throttle body injection's easy because you just can spray and it's gonna go to all the cylinders, right? Just like carburetors. CIS is not like that. Each one has its own little injector. So if you're not using computer controls, how the heck do you control which one sprays at which time? Do we spray them at the same time? They actually used, a little fuel distributor. So our fuel distributor, oops, going from the wrong place here. Our fuel distributor here is going to, kind of like an ignition distributor, going to determine which cylinder is going to get fuel and when. Now, how does it know more fuel or less fuel? If it gets more air, it needs more fuel, right? If you press on that gas pedal, which is actually an air pedal, you're letting in more air. Well, if we wanna make more power, we're gonna need more fuel. And so what would happen is you would have this little plunger um, that as air would go past, it's showing air sensor. It's not really a sensor, it's a plunger. And as air would go past, it would move the plunger, which would give it more fuel as well. So really cool because it doesn't require any computer uh, really technology, but it's, can, it can be very complicated. These types of systems do not like to sit at all and they do require some, um, some maintenance and some preventative maintenance. So I uh, just wanna, didn't wanna get into this too much. Volkswagen, I believe, use this. Mercedes, Porsche use this. A lot of German manufacturers use this, but we stopped using this a long time ago. So what we're looking at here is the next stepping stone, which was port fuel injection. We still use this today in a lot of vehicles. Um, one injector per cylinder. So for each cylinder, we've got one injector that's assigned for it. It's going to be right above our intake valve and our intake manifold. So our injector is not going to be in the in the head necessarily right here. It's showing a little bit weird. It's going to be at the very base of our intake manifold going into the cylinder head. And it's going to try to get that nozzle as close to the intake valve generally as possible. Um, 
Fuel pressure is going to be a lot higher. We're looking at around 35 to 70 PSI for this one. Again, pressure differential is going to make for better atomization. So the higher we have our fuel pressure, the better. Now, these fuel injectors aren't really meant to go any higher than 70 PSI. So going higher than that could cause issues, leaky fuel injectors, things like that. The most important thing to note on port fuel injection is that Fuel pressure varies with engine load, meaning where your gas pedal is and how hard your engine is working. And the reason for this is because of vacuum. So I'm gonna take a moment here and I'm gonna stop share because I wanna to talk to you guys about, put my markers here. I wanna to talk to you a little bit about vacuum. Vacuum is something that we might have discussed earlier but didn't get really really into uh, but it's so important to understand what it is and, and where it comes from in order to really be able to understand why we designed our systems the way that we did so this is our this is my beautiful engine here four cylinder probably honda we got a skunk to and take manifold here um what happens is we have our throttle plate when you're sitting at a red light and you're at idle, the throttle plate is generally closed, right? Obviously, it's not a perfect seal. Our engine does get some air and it does get some fuel or else it would die every time we stopped. So that's idle. But when you go to take off, you're racing somebody in your Prius and uh, you open that throttle plate all the way wide, uh, freaking open, right? we allow a bunch of air into our cylinders. Um, we are generally gonna have some sort of uh, air sensor up here. I'll go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll just go ahead and add a little sensor here. It's got wires on it. This sensor, um, we'll just call it a uh, MAF or mass airflow sensor, is going to determine how much air, the density of the air coming in, which by the way, if you want to make good power, you need dense air, which means you need colder air. Engines like to be hot, but they like to breathe cold air. Does that make sense? They don't like to be cold. Uh, engines like to be hot. They like to be hot, but they want to breathe in cold air. Um, I talked about expansion with fuel and expansion domes and gasoline, stuff like that. So when it's hot, it expands. When it's cold, it condenses, right? Well, the same thing applies to your air. The colder the air, the more it's going to be condensed, meaning if I pull in a certain amount of air, the colder it is, the more oxygen molecules I have in there. Well, it turns out the more oxygen I have, the more power I can make as long as I match it with fuel. And so we need to know how much air is coming in this system. It's going to tell the computer, it's an input, it's going to tell the computer, this is how much air is coming in, we are going to squirt fuel injector, or, or squirt our fuel injectors down here at the base of our intake manifold. Everything's great, you make power. When you're not, let's say you go back to that red light and we close our throttle plate. What we have here is a pressure change. We are no longer allowed to have air going through as much, as some is coming in, like I said, or else we would stall. Um, and what we have is pistons moving up and down inside the cylinder, right? We've got our, you guys remember the four stroke cycle, right? Sex, squeeze, bang, blow. On the intake stroke, we've got a piston on any of these. If they're in the intake stroke, let's say this one's on the intake stroke, the piston is moving down with the intake valve open. That means if I was to take a syringe and pull that, the, the back of the syringe out, as uh, I'm creating a negative space. I'm, I'm just using, just for lack of a better term here, negative space, but it's not really negative space. I'm, I'm creating a space with lower pressure. Well, anytime we have a pressure differential, let's say I have um, two boxes and I put a little tube in between these two boxes. If I had a high pressure over here and a lower pressure over here, Let's say I made a door and I open that door. As soon as I open up the door between these two boxes, the pressure from my high wants to go to the low until they equal out. 
and not neither of them is high or lower than the other, they're just equal. That would be a zero differential, right? Well, that's a little bit what we're looking at. If we create a low pressure space, let's say inside the cylinder on the intake stroke, the piston's moving down, we're creating a low pressure space, which will then create a pressure differential. Low pressure, which outside we have a higher pressure, atmospheric, right? That means this is gonna wanna suck air in. We create a suction. When you hear the term vacuum, you're referring, to, you're thinking of the vacuum in your house or some sort of suction, right? That's why, because if I have a vacuum, I have a pressure differential, and that means I'm gonna have air that wants to move from one area to another because of that pressure differential. Hopefully that makes sense. So, if my throttle plate's closed, I have a pressure differential inside my intake manifold versus outside. Anything that is less than atmospheric is a vacuum. So if I've got uh, atmospheric pressure at sea level is going to be 14.7 PSI, pounds per square inch, right? All around you. You're like, what? There's no pressure around you. There is. And if there wasn't, we would just sort of fall apart. So. There is a pressure around us with our atmospheric pressure. Anything that is less than that because we're creating a low pressure and our throttle plate is closed. So there's two reasons for this low pressure. A, our throttle plate is closed. So we're not allowing any of the high pressure really to come in. We're allowing little tiny bits, but it's a major restriction. And I've got pistons that are moving down, creating a low pressure space. So both of those things are going to create a lower pressure in here than in here or than outside. So what is a vacuum? A vacuum is any pressure lower than atmospheric. That's it. As easy as that. Now, here's what I'm getting at. I'm sort of taking the long way around here, but this is really, really important. I'm going to draw a fuel injector here because I can't draw it at you. Let's say I've got my fuel injector here. Um, and it's injecting fuel in here. I'm trying to draw it so it doesn't look like GDI because it's not GDI. Um, we're injecting it in, uh, sorry, this is just gonna drive me nuts. Okay, so we've got our fuel injector in our intake manifold and it wants to squirt fuel into our cylinder. Here's the reason why fuel pressure has to vary with fuel injected engines. Uh, when I say fuel injected, I'm referring to port fuel injection, not throttle body injection. These fuel injectors are inside your intake manifold. What's inside your intake manifold, especially when the throttle plates close? Vacuum, right? Well, vacuum, we know, as I mentioned already, if I've got two different pressures, I've got a low pressure and a high pressure, everything wants to sort of suck to the low pressure until it equalizes. Well, when you're at idle and your throttle plates closed, not only do I have fuel pressure pushing fuel out of the fuel injector, but I also have vacuum helping to suck fuel out of the fuel injector. Now, when I have no vacuum, I open up my throttle plate, I no longer have a pressure differential, right? Everything wants to equalize. And so now I no longer have vacuum helping to suck fuel out and I don't have that same pressure differential. Well, if they're too equal, I'm not gonna get a whole lot of fuel coming out. I'm also not gonna get very good at atomization and really atomization is key to efficiency, is key to power, it's, it's key to a lot of things, even burning. We, when I say atomize, we want tiny, 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 tiny little droplets. We want to emulsify the fuel in the air as much as possible. And the larger the droplets, the, the less atomization, less power, less efficiency, blah, 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 right? Well, if we want to maintain that pressure differential for atomization, at idle, I only need a little bit of pressure because I've got vacuum helping suck fuel out. But when I'm at wide open throttle, I've got no vacuum in here. I'm gonna need to increase the pressure on this side of my fuel injector to maintain a pressure differential from here to here. That way we can maintain atomization. 
Now, many people will say, oh, you have to very feel pressure because sometimes you need more power, right? Um, let's take a look at this for a moment. If you have a port fuel injection vehicle and you, let's say, need to step on the gas, you need more fuel, you know, fuel pressure needs to go up because you need more fuel. That's not how we control the amount of fuel in the engine. And if it was, then wouldn't throttle body injection have to do the same thing? Wouldn't carburetors have to do the same thing? But they don't. And the reason why those don't feel very fuel pressure, like TBI, because they're not subject to vacuum. They always have the same pressure differential from outside to inside the fuel system. And so it never needs to change because you're maintaining a pressure differential. How do they control fuel? By controlling pulse width, how long the fuel injector is open for. If they want more fuel, they'll leave it open for longer. If they want less fuel, they'll leave it open for less longer, less long. <laughs> um, so that is just in a nutshell, that is vacuum, how we make vacuum. That is why we have to vary fuel pressure on uh, in fuel injection systems that are subject to vacuum and we don't on, thing, uh, on fuel injection systems that are not subject to vacuum. So hopefully that made a little bit of sense to everybody. If not, you have any questions, please post them in the comments and I will help you out. Uh, so let's get back to our fuel injection presentation here. So uh, fuel pressure varies with engine load due to vacuum change. And we can see here in this picture, we've got our fuel injector that is injecting fuel above our intake valve. And you can see here, here's our intake runner. This is subject to vacuum. If I've got lots of vacuum, then I've got a good pressure differential from our fuel pressure uh, and, and compare that to the other side of the fuel injector. If I have no vacuum and I've got atmospheric pressure down here, I have shortened that pressure differential. And so the fuel isn't as excited to get out of the fuel injector and we don't get as good of atomization. And so um, we need to increase that fuel pressure. And I'll talk to you guys about how to do that with a fuel pressure regulator or with the computer um, in a little bit here. All righty, so let's move on. This is a sort of cutaway picture here. So we've got our cylinder, our intake valve. Here is um, our intake from our throttle. Obviously this is much shortened up compared to what it is in real life. <clears throat> and here, that would be a really big valve compared to our throttle plate if that was the case. So here's our fuel injector spring right above the, the intake valve there. Oops. All right, now what we have really gone to because it's superior in most ways, there's a couple of challenges, um, but when it comes to atomization, it's, it's hard to beat direct fuel injection. They call this DFI or GDFI. Um, DFI is just direct fuel injection. Most all diesels are gonna be direct fuel injection. Um, but GDFI is gasoline direct fuel injection and that is, where the direction of this industry is going. We're seeing more and more gasoline engines go to GDFI. And there's a number of reason, reasons for that. So it injects fuel not above the intake manifold, it injects fuel above our, um, it does not inject fuel above our intake manifold, it injects fuel, or above our intake valve, it injects fuel right where uh, the cylinder is, it's right next to the spark plug. So we've got our spark plug here, we've got our fuel injector here next to each other. It is the best type for fuel metering and fuel economy. The reason for this is on any other design, the further away we inject our fuel, carburetors and TBI, the more the fuel has a chance to stick to the walls of the intake. So we have a lot of waste fuel. We have to inject more because we know we're gonna lose some on the way. And that's sort of a problem. Um, this design, you inject exactly the amount that is needed. And you're, you, you, can, you can get down to such a finite amount uh, uh, or uh, how small we're allowed to measure how much fuel goes in. You use exactly the amount that it needs and that is all. And so you can get really, really good gas mileage with this. But 
here's the problem. Remember how our PFI or our pore fuel injection had to overcome atmospheric pressure when you're at wide open throttle and had to increase fuel pressure because of that. So not only does this fuel injector for a GDFI system have to overcome atmospheric pressure, they have to overcome compression pressures inside the cylinder because they, rather than uh, in squirt fuel um, on the intake stroke, GDFI engines don't squirt fuel on the intake stroke. They squirt fuel on the compression stroke. And the reason for this is if I can, uh, I want to squirt fuel as late as possible so it stays atomized right before it ignites. The longer my fuel hangs out inside the cylinder, the longer it has for fuel to sort of create droplets. It wants to condense. And so if I can wait a little bit, so intake, we pull in a lot of air, we close that, the piston comes up on compression. When it starts to significantly compress, then it will squirt out fuel, but we have pressure in here, lots of pressure. And so that's why on GDFI systems, we have to have some sort of mechanical step up pump to increase fuel pressure. So we'll have a normal electric fuel pump, 35 to 75 PSI um, coming from our fuel tank to the engine. And right at the engine, we'll have a mechanical step up pump that will increase our fuel pressure to potentially 3000 PSI. Not something you necessarily want to mess with. Um, there's a couple of things about this. It's really, really important on a, a GDFI system that you do not disconnect any fuel lines until you know for sure that you have depressurized the system. Um, but we do get crazy high pressures. And the reason why we don't just get a really like badass electric fuel pump in the tank that's going to create 3,000 PSI is because then I have more potential for leaks anywhere from the gas tank all the way up to the engine. So rather than risk that, what we do is we just have that 35 to 70 PSI, and then we don't step it up up until the engine. And uh, there, there is usually pr very little problems with that. We, get, we don't have tons of fuel leaks and things like that because we do that. Um, and, and so that, that's just sort of GDFI in a nutshell. We'll talk a lot more about this stuff when you guys get into a tune-up class. Now, there are a couple challenges with GDFI. One of the benefits of port fuel injection is that because it injects fuel right above the intake valve, it actually uses gasoline to clean the intake valves. And especially if you're using gasoline that has a lot of really good detergents, like any top tier gas, Chevron, Tecron, Shell, any of that stuff. Um, but with GDFI, we don't, we directly inject it into the engine. And so nothing is cleaning your intake valves and your intake valves get debris from not just intake air, but you also, um, there's a system you don't know about because we'll talk about it in two weeks here when we get into emission controls that is going to be our crankcase ventilation system. Um, or our PCV positive crankcase ventilation, where we take gases from our crankcase and we reroute them into the intake. I know I don't want to get into this rabbit hole yet, but that um, PCV system does have little oil droplets. And since we're rerouting it into the intake, that PCV system, which didn't used to be a problem, then becomes a problem. And then we get intake valves that look like this, that create hesitation or stalling problems. And so in order to prevent this carbon buildup on the intake valves, it's really, really, really important to um, clean these periodically. The walnut shelling is really uh, common. They also make uh, good chemical cleanings that you'll just blast your intake valves with. So you'll take off your intake manifold, clean these, um, and you'll take care to not get stuff inside the engine. Um, also, since your direct fuel injectors are so high pressure, they're super sensitive to lower quality fuel. As I mentioned, top tier gas has more detergents and uh, is really important that you use top tier gas with GDFI engines. Um, lower alcohol content would probably be a good idea. So no more than that 10%. And then also your engine oil is going to be really, really important as well. Um, and that's another reason, not because of the injectors, but your high pressure step up pump is a mechanical pump that runs off of the camshaft. So um, 
you do have some extra challenges with your engine oil. So it's really important to use good fuel and use good engine oil. Long gone are the days um, where you can just use whatever trash and, and you'd have a, a Toyota pickup that lasts you 400,000 miles. If you have a GDFI engine, there's a lot of benefits, but it's really important that you take care of it. You take care of it, it takes care of you. Another downfall is that they are noisy. Um, the injectors are noisy and also your step up fuel pump is noisy. It's not super noisy. You're not going to really hear it inside of the passenger compartment, but if you were to pop the hood and take covers off, you'll definitely hear it. It's louder than PFI engine stuff or, or injection. So here's another picture of a GDI system. This one's actually a real cutaway here. So we've got our spark plug. Here's our valves here. Um, and then we've got our injector right next to it injecting fuel. So uh, kind of cool deal. This is a real picture. All the other ones are all like all drawings. I think we've got another one here as well. So here are them all together sort of stepping stones. Here we've got our TBI above the throttle plate. Here we've got our PFI or multi-port fuel injection where our fuel injectors are in the intake manifold. And here on GDFI, we've got our uh, fuel injectors directly into the, uh, directly into our cylinders. So that is sort of in a nutshell, our systems that we have. Now, <coughs> excuse me. What we have to regulate our fuel pressure is a fuel pressure regulator. Um, there are two types of systems, not two types of fuel pressure regulators, but two types of systems. We have a return type system uh, and we have a return list system. A return type system is going to allow fuel in from our fuel pump, right? And what you can't see here is this is actually, this fuel pressure regulator is actually going to be mounted on the end of our fuel rail. I have a picture here in a moment. I'll show you. So you can't see the fuel where it goes to our fuel injectors because it's actually on the other side. Um, I've got, so this is on the end of my fuel rail. I've got fuel in and I've got fuel out and I've got vacuum. So what we have here is fuel in and I've got this rubber diaphragm with a spring up top here. So fuel's allowed down here, but not up here. And this spring tension is going to override and push this diaphragm down. So we've got fuel pressure coming in and as long as we don't increase too much, the fuel pressure that's coming in is going to feed our, our injectors. But if I'm say at idle and I don't need as high a fuel pressure, how do I decrease my fuel pressure? So what we do is we connect, this says to fuel injector, that is incorrect. This is actually a vacuum line. Um, this is gonna to connect to a vacuum line and it is going to help pull, because vacuum, low pressure, that vacuum is actually going to help pull up this diaphragm and override the spring tension here. And fuel, when pressure gets too high, is going to help push up that diaphragm. And all excess fuel that we don't want because it's too much pressure is going to be allowed to return to the fuel tank. Uh, so that's how your fuel pressure regulators work. Um, on a return type system, this is a return line that goes back to the fuel tank. On a return list system, we have no vacuum line and our fuel pressure regulator is gonna be actually inside the tank with our fuel pump. And rather than varying fuel pressure, it just maintains a particular fuel pressure and it'll just, once it goes past that fuel pressure, it'll just dump it back into the tank rather than needing any return line. So there's pros and cons to return type systems. Return type systems have a tendency to let fuel get hot and return it back to the engine, which we then get excess HC emissions. Um, and so we tried to get away from a return type system because of that. There's part of it that also allows fuel to cool down, but we won't get into that stuff. I'll talk more in depth when we get into a tune-up class. Um, but only return type systems need a vacuum line. Again, this is not to a fuel injector, that's to a vacuum line. Here is a couple of pictures of our actual fuel pressure regulator. Uh, so here we've got our vacuum line. Here is our fuel in, and it doesn't look like we can see our fuel out coming out, but here is it attached to the fuel rail. Here is a, here's a picture all together of everything. So here's a V8 engine. 
you can see fuel is going to come in this side of our rail. It's gonna come here and our fuel uh, regulator is going to be at the very end. And if fuel pressure exceeds the spring tension, uh, it's going to push up the diaphragm here and then it's going to allow fuel back to our tank. So that is a, on a return type system. And here's a cutaway, same thing. Here's that rubber diaphragm, the spring. This almost looks like, like a return list because I don't see a vacuum line up here, but I might just not be able to see that. And here's our, um, here's our return line. So then we'll go ahead and go to the next slide. So next we're gonna talk a little bit about injection timing uh, because just like your ignition timing, injectors need to be told when to inject. They're not just, unless it's a CIS system, they're not just continuously injecting. Uh, so there's a couple of different ways. I'm not gonna get super into it, um, but one way is going to be what has multiple names actually. Uh, in your book, I believe they call it simultaneous injection timing, also known as grouped or banked timing. What we have here, and in this set, the, the word simultaneous sort of tells it all. It means that we are injecting at simultaneously. So right here, you can see these. each of these coils is actually an injector. It's just a solenoid. Remember, we're creating a magnetic field to open up the fuel injector. What we have here are, say, if this is a six cylinder, we've got three drivers that will inject fuel maybe two simultaneously at a time, and one may not use the, the fuel um, while others might be on the same stroke, depending on how many cylinders it is, it just depends. So we've got simultaneous group or banked. Now the one that we use now uh, does require a cam angle sensor. So we know not only crank angle, what is it at TDC or BDC, but we also know what stroke it's on if we have a cam angle sensor. So if we know that it's on uh, intake, then we know it's time to inject. And so you can see here, it says microprocessor, it's our PCM. Um, our powertrain control module. And you can see here, we've got a six cylinder engine and you can see we've got multiple drivers, injector drivers that are going to control individually the fuel injectors. So they're able to fire exactly when they need them. Uh, and that's about as far as I'll get in this class for this. Two terms that I mentioned uh, earlier were pre-ignition and detonation. It's important to know first and foremost that they are not the same. And it's important to know how they happen so you can avoid them because they're not good for your engine. First things first, what is pre-ignition? Well, pre-anything means it happens before it's supposed to. So pre-ignition means that the ignition of fuel happens before the spark event occurs. So if I'm using, a, a, let's say, a lower octane rating fuel than I'm supposed to, what will happen is as my uh, piston is coming up on compression, before my spark plug is, is going to ignite, I'll get a hot spot or something inside, uh, not necessarily a hot spot, but the pressure inside the the, the cylinder increases so much that that fuel becomes unstable and it ignites all on its own, just like a diesel does normally. But gasoline engines aren't supposed to do that normally. And so what happens is, and why this is bad, is because I've got my piston coming up on compression. Now down here, I've got my bicycle pedals, my crankshaft, right? So I'm coming up on compression. What's supposed to happen is that I start to ignite before I get all the way to TDC. I start to ignite with my spark plug because it takes time for the fuel to ignite. And it starts to push down the piston after I've already reached TDC, almost like a, a foot pressing down on a bicycle pedal to move forward. That's how things are supposed to be. But if my piston is coming up on compression and we're not even close to TDC and it tries to ignite it, be, not it tries to ignite it, the fuel ignites on accident, it tries to push the piston back in the opposite direction on the crankshaft. The thing is, is that, and if you've ever ridden a fixed gear bicycle, you know this, you're not stopping. There's way too much forward momentum. You fly off the bike, right? Your piston and rod is not going to fly off the crankshaft, but it does really hammer down on that rod bearing on the crankshaft. It's hard. It's like taking a hammer and hitting it against the top of the piston. That's how harsh it is. So pre-ignition is not good and it creates a knock or a ping. 
Luckily, your engine, computer controlled engines, use what we call a knock sensor, and it will pick up this frequency and it will generate a signal to send to the computer and the computer's like, whoa, we don't want that to happen. And so what we do is we'll retard the ignition timing um, and, and change some things so we don't make this, this happen necessarily. So we'll get more into that into a tune-up class, but I just want you to know that essentially we're detuning the engine when we, uh, when we get that knocking. If it happens uncontrollably because the fuel is just not the right fuel, your engine will definitely um, detune to where you will notice a power loss um, because it's trying to protect itself. Detonation is something a little bit different. Now, pre-ignition can lead to detonation um, and honestly, so on and so forth. Detonation is where my spark ignites the air-fuel mixture so you can see down here, my spark ignites the air fuel mixture, but because of hot spots in the cylinder, maybe the side, maybe because I've machined my engine too thin, I get a hot spot on the cylinder, or maybe I've got a carbon piece that dropped from my intake valve, right, from the carbon buildup that's hanging out and is glowing red hot. Well, I might get a secondary ignition from at either of those hot spots, and those flame fronts collide and we have a very unstable combustion inside our cylinder, which again, very hard on the piston, very hard on uh, our rod bearings and, and, and things like that. So it's a collision of frame fronts. Now, if I have a uh, detonation, I create more hot spots, and maybe the next time around, I have pre-ignition because of the hot spots. So detonation can lead to pre-ignition. Pre-ignition can eventually lead to detonation. Neither of them are good. And so it's really important to use the correct fuel um, and, and things like that. So moving along here. How do we know how much fuel we need? So I'm just gonna make this very, very basic because next week I'm gonna get a little bit more into computer controls. But essentially what we have is an open loop operation and closed loop operation. Our PCM, our powertrain control module, uses a closed loop operation to maintain a stoichiometric ratio. So what that means is if you look here, up here we've got open loop, down here we've got closed loop. Let's look at closed loop first. So what we have here is uh, we've got our computer. Our computer is gonna tell the fuel injector, open up for this long. Fuel injector is going to inject fuel into the engine. It's gonna burn it. And out of the exhaust, uh, we've got an oxygen sensor. And that oxygen, also known as an O2 sensor, also sometimes known as an AFR, or air fuel ratio sensor, um, is going to report back to the computer and let the computer know whether it was too much fuel, we call that term rich, or not enough fuel, that term is lean. So it's gonna tell the computer either rich or lean, right? And the computer is gonna make adjustments off of that. So if it was too much fuel, it's rich, it's gonna tell the, the fuel injector, hey, maybe not as much this time, only open up for this many milliseconds rather than this many milliseconds. And it will shorten up the pulse width of our fuel injector. It will inject that amount of fuel into the engine. It will uh, ignite and then come out the exhaust and then we're gonna see it again. So it's this, that's why they call it closed loop because it's like a circle, right? It's a circle. We try it, did it work? No, okay, let's try that again. Try it, nope, too much, all right, let's lessen it up. Try it again, oh, too little, let's, let's add more. And it's just gonna keep going back and forth. That is closed loop operation, and it's always trying to maintain a 14.7, remember that? That's our atmospheric pressure, but it's also the best, uh, most efficient for uh, our, our uh, fuel ratio, air to fuel ratio. 14, by the way, let me just break this down here. We've got an air fuel ratio, 14.7 to one, Keep that term in mind, air fuel ratio. If you're gonna guess which one, 14.7 uh, or one is air or fuel, which one would you guess? Well, if you guess that 14.7 was fuel and one was air, that would mean we have more fuel in the cylinder than air. 
Now that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense, does it? And uh, that's not going to be really good for atomization. So 14.7, that first number, that is air, while one is fuel. The higher the number over here, so if it was 16 to 1, it would be even less fuel. If it was lower, like 10 to 1, it would be more fuel. Stoichiometric, sort of perfect, is going to be 14.7 to 1. And so our computer is always going to be trying to maintain that. Now, we're still trying to maintain that even though, uh, you know, different conditions change. Atmospheric pressure may change if you're going up to the mountains, um, things like that. So it's, it's constantly on a feedback loop. There are two reasons why you may go into an open loop. So me, open loop means the computer tells the fuel injector what to do, it burns it, it goes in the exhaust, the oxygen sensor tells the computer, hey, that was rich, too much fuel, the computer says, eh, I don't care. Two reasons it might do that. A, you're at wide open throttle. You're trying to have fun, and the computer doesn't want to mess with your fun, and so it's not going to listen to that pesky, annoying Karen of an oxygen sensor. It's going to say, be quiet. I don't care if that was too much fuel. We want to win this race. Um, or if your engine is uh, cold. If your engine is cold, it requires more fuel. And so the oxygen sensor is going to always say that it's rich because we're simply trying to warm the engine up. Once the engine warms up, let's say less than a minute. Um, and when, when I say warms up, warms up enough. Um, how long should you let your engine warm up? I don't know if we've talked about this before. 30 seconds to a minute is plenty to get into closed loop operation. Now, if you're worried about your engine being worn out or maybe it's a performance built engine, you wanna give your pistons time to expand, you may wanna take a couple of minutes, but that's not something you should do for every vehicle because you will produce more emissions by sitting there waiting for 10 minutes for your engine to warm up. So just keep that in mind. So those two reasons are the only reason you would go into open loop. Besides that, it may be a fault of some sort or maybe a sensor is not working and then you might go into open loop. Um, and that is priorities. Priority number one is to get that engine up to running temperature. Priority number two is for you not to die. Well, not number two. Another priority number one is for you not to die on the freeway when you're trying to speed up on the on-ramp to get ahead of a semi-truck uh, in your Toyota Matrix. So, and not get ran over in the process. So it's important they don't care that it's rich. I don't care, I don't care, I don't care. Now when you're back to cru cruising speed, you've let off the throttle, we're back in a closed loop operation again, and it's going to go back into that loop. So we have an input from our sensors. The, the unit itself, the PCM is gonna process that information, and then it's going to have an output, and that output's gonna be something like a fuel injector that does something. So I think I've got some that looks a little bit, uh, here we go. So more about inputs and, and outputs. As they relate, there are more inputs than this, lots more, but as they relate to fuel, and this isn't even all of them, um, well, how do we know how much fuel that my engine's gonna need? Here's my fuel rail, right? Here's my injector, um, and here's how it's controlled. There's a couple other things in here I won't get into a high pressure pump because this is a direct injection. Um, but we're looking at one, engine speed. That's gonna determine how much fuel I need. How about engine load, right? Um, and when I say engine load, how much vacuum is in our intake manifold here? Because if it's no vacuum, I've got a high load, meaning my, my pedals to the metal, or I'm going up a hill, I need more fuel, right? Engine temperature, if the engine is cold, it requires more fuel, requires more fuel. Um, it, it can't do the same thing efficiently and so until it heats up so engine temperature is going to play a role in it your ex engine uh your exhaust oxygen content is going to let the computer know whether it's rich or lean intake air how much air do i have coming in remember that mass airflow sensor i was talking about i'll talk more about that next week but i need to know how much air is coming in if it's not a lot of air if it's colder out i need more fuel because i'm getting more air a uh, throttle position if I'm not on the throttle at all versus pedal to the metal, my computer needs to know so it can tell me how, or it can tell the fuel injector adequately how much fuel it needs. And like I said, there's plenty more, uh, but I won't get into it right now. Outputs are things, so inputs are things that uh, have the term sensor into it. It's sending a signal and that's it. It's, it's like a narc, right? It's just, it's not doing anything, it's just giving information.
the computer does all the processing and the thinking and once it's reached a decision which is usually very fast much faster than we are able to it tells things to do things anything that actually does something it creates movement is going to be considered an output so injectors that open and close that's an output any solenoid is an output fuel pressure uh what about um your fuel pump like a, a return list design where maybe it pulses uh, the fuel pump to, to increase or decrease fuel pressure, that's an output. Any motor, anything that moves, anything that makes sound or light, those are all outputs. They do something. They're the muscle, right? So uh, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and I think that's it. So we made it. All right, guys, we're going to stop share here. That is electronic fuel injection in a nutshell. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it wasn't too boring for you. If you have any questions at all, please make sure that you guys are posting in the comments um, and I will reach out as soon as I see them. So I will see you guys next time.